If someone were to ask you to describe who God is in his nature and his character, what are some things you might say? Some replies might be, God is all-powerful, all-knowing, all-wise. He's full of mercy, grace, and truth. God is love. Always willing to forgive when asked. But in thinking about who God is, how often does the word joy come to mind? Do we picture God as one who exudes great joy? Do we think he's a cantankerous grouch? Or maybe even just completely void of emotion? Our understanding of who God is is extremely important because it will affect how we choose to relate to him. Let me say that again. Our understanding of who God is will affect how we choose to relate to him, either from a distance or up close and personal. And so it is very important that our understanding of who God is comes from the truth of the Bible that God has told us himself in his word who he is. The title of today's message that relates to our candle lighting theme this morning is Behold the God of Joy. How do we know God is a joyous God? One reason is the fruit of the Spirit that Paul talks about in Galatians 5. The first three men he mentions in verse 22 are love, joy, peace. God does not so much have love as God is love. God doesn't have joy. God is joy in his very being. God doesn't have peace. He is peace. Love, joy, peace are parts of who God is in his very nature. So today we're looking at God's joy and ours if we have relationship with him. Even though God is joy, there are still some things that bring him joy. One of those, letter A in your outline, God delights in and rejoices over his children. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Isaiah says to God's people in chapter 62, verse 5, as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. It is God's nature and character to delight in and rejoice or express joy over his people. We're told in the Bible that one of the times God does this is the moment a person becomes one of God's children. John 1, 12 and 13 teaches us, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God, born of the Spirit. John is telling us no one is born a child of God. No one is a child of God through the natural birth, but we become one of God's children through the spiritual birth of trusting in Christ as our Lord and Savior. So let's look at the enthusiastic delight and the exuberant joy God experiences when a person becomes one of his children, when what was lost or separated from God becomes found and in relationship with him. 
Jesus shares a few parables in Luke 15 about how a shepherd, a woman, and a father react when they find something valuable that was separated from them. Verses 1 through 10 state, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Shame on him. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. Then Jesus says, in the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus then tells his listeners a made-up story about a father who had a son who asked for his inheritance early before the father died. We looked at this parable in our previous series on the parables of Jesus. The son goes off and wastes all his inheritance with wild living. When he comes to his senses, he returns home, hoping that the father will just have him back as a hired servant, not as a son, but as a hired servant, because he knows how much he has disgraced his father. But as he's nearing home in Jesus' story, his father sees him in the distance, runs to him, him gives him a big hug, and lavishes kisses on him. He may have been pretty ripe from being with the pigs for a number of weeks. In verse 21, the son says to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And before he could even ask to come back as a hired worker, His father interrupts his confession in verses 22 to 24. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and now is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. In these parables, these made-up stories of Jesus about the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, who is it that rejoices the most? Who is it that has the most joy when the lost thing is found? It's the shepherd, the woman, and the Father, who each represent God the Father. When the shepherd finds his lost sheep, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders, calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. When the woman found her lost coin, Commentaries say it was probably part of her dowry that was so important. She also calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. And then when the son, who was in essence lost, separated from his father, comes home, 
The father, in essence, calls his neighbors and friends together, has a big party, and says, rejoice with me. My lost son has come home. After sharing about the lost sheep and the lost coin, Jesus declares in Luke 15, 10, in the same way I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. What we typically hear about this verse is, yes, the angels in heaven express great joy when a person comes to faith in Christ and understands what he did for them on a cross and they trust him as their Lord and Savior. The angels in heaven rejoice. But God's angels are represented by the friends and the neighbors in Jesus' parables. It is the owner, it is God himself who rejoices first when a person comes to faith. And the angels just pick up on his joy and rejoice as well. Listen to what Jameson, Facet, and Brown, their commentary says about verse 10. Know carefully the language here employed. It is not joy among or on the part of, but joy before or in the presence of the angels of God. True to the idea of the parables, it is the great shepherd, the great owner himself, whose joy over his own recovered property is so vast and exuberant that it is as if he could not keep it to himself. He calls his friends and neighbors, his whole celestial family, saying, rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep. I found my property which was lost. They continue, in this sublime sense, it is joy before or in the presence of the angels. They only catch God's flying joy. If you're a follower of Christ, if you've trusted in Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, the very moment in time that you did that, God himself started a huge celebration in heaven. Maybe with heavenly hash ice cream and angel food cake. But let that sink in. The moment you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the all-powerful God of the universe started a celebration in heaven. He was so fired up about that. And the angels joined him in that heavenly celebration. And why would the all-powerful, infinite God of the universe initiate this joyous celebration? Because he loves you. Because he created you to be in relationship with him. Created you to experience his love, his joy, his peace, and to love him in return. I've been sharing the gospel quite clearly the last few weeks. When Adam and Eve mess up and disobey God, there, become, there became a separation and an estrangement in their lives from God. And every person born since is born separated from God. But God didn't like that. Because he created us to be in relationship. So what did he do about it? He sent Christ into this world to go to the cross so we could be in a renewed, restored relationship with God in this life and be with him in heaven forever. But God not only 
delights in and rejoices over a person when we become a Christian and begin a personal relationship with him. Number two, he also delights and rejoices in the continuing loving relationship we have with him as his people. When our son Nate was born, we have a picture of me holding him in the hospital, and I'm just grinning from ear to ear. I was so thrilled that this little guy had, was born and come into this world and was our child, but specifically was my son, my child. But my joy did not stop the next day when he left the hospital. One of the great joys of my life still is having Nate as my son. Tori, his wife, as, as my daughter, daughter-in-law, but we don't use the in-law. Now, there were times over the years when Nate was growing up where he didn't listen to what I asked him to do. I get frustrated with him. But they were just temporary and secondary feelings and emotions. Underneath was still the solid, unchanging, unconditional love that I had for him and my commitment to him. You getting the connection? Likewise, if we're followers of Christ, God gets frustrated with us when we mess up, when we choose to do our will and not God's will in our lives. But that is also a secondary emotion he has. Temporary. To the enormous, unchanging, unconditional gift of love he has for us and his commitment to us. Underneath those temporary, secondary feelings God has is the great delight and joy God has in that we continue to be his child, that we have relationship with him now that will continue in heaven forever. We see this truth in Jeremiah 31, 18 to 20, where God says to Ephraim, which was the northern kingdom of Israel, I have surely heard Ephraim's moaning. They're complaining. You disciplined me like an unruly calf, and I have been disciplined. Restore me, and I will return, because you are the Lord my God. After I strayed, I repented. After I came to understand, I beat my breast. I was ashamed and humiliated because I bore the disgrace of my youth. We've all been there and we're all still there. Then God says, and the italicized words are mine, is not Ephraim my dear son, the child in whom I delight? Though I often speak against him, God may have said to his angels, look at my Ephraim messing up again. I wish he would return to me. I still remember him. I still think of him often. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I have great compassion for him, declares the Lord. If we have a relationship with God through Christ, he also thinks of us often. And when we mess up, God longs for us to confess it to him. He yearns for us to return to him. Like the father of the prodigal son. The word compassion here means God loves us deeply and with a tender affection. But how does God express his delight? his joy over the relationship he has with us as his children. 
One of the ways is letter B. God rejoices over his children with singing. In Zephaniah 3, 16 and 17, God says through the Old Testament prophet, on that day they will say to Jerusalem, do not fear, O Zion. Do not let your hands have, hang limp. Don't be depressed. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you, calm you down with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. He will take great delight in you and rejoice over you with singing. The verb to rejoice here, which I don't hurt myself. The verb rejoice here literally means to jump up and spin around. The verb translated singing means to cry out, to shout out loud. You cannot escape the uninhibited enthusiasm of these words. God himself celebrates the continual loving personal relationship he has with each of his followers with passionate, joyful singing. Sam Storms, in his wonderful book entitled The Singing God, paraphrases Zephaniah 3, 17. The Lord your God is with you all the time. He is a powerful and mighty warrior who saved you. When he thinks of you, he exalts in festive pleasure and with great delight. At other times, he becomes quiet as he reflects on his deep affection for you. He celebrates who you are with joyful singing. He celebrates who you are as one of his kids with joyful singing. If you are a parent, have you ever made up a song and sung it over your kids? I made up two songs I used to sing when Nate was an infant and a toddler. At the risk of humbling myself, one of them went like this. Nathan Grimley is his name, E-I-E-I-O. He is such a handsome boy. He gives mommy and daddy joy. Oh, what a wonderful boy he is, E-I-E-I-O-O-O. -O -O. You had to be there and you had to be an infant, so. But I was singing with rejoicing over the fact that he's my son. God the Father also rejoices with singing over you if you are his son, if you're his daughter. I trust with better lyrics than I just shared. So we see that God is joy in his very being. He gushes with joy the moment a person comes to faith in Christ and begins a relationship with him. And continuing to relate to you in a personal relationship continues to bring God great joy because he loves you and he created you to be in relationship with him. This leads us to let her see knowing God and his love for us should result in joy. This can be a whole message on its own, but briefly, Jesus tells his followers in John 15, verse 9 and 11, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. In essence, he's saying, 
the same love that God has for me, I have for you. Now remain in my love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Jesus is saying when we really understand how much God loves us and what he did on a cross for us and who we are in relationship with him, that God's very own joy will be dwelling within us through his indwelling Holy Spirit. And he desires that our joy be complete, overflowing, full and abundant. Peter also tells God's people in 1 Peter 1, verses 8 and 9, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not physically see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Why? For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. For followers of Christ, when we really understand the gospel, the good news that what we deserve from this holy God is separation from him, both now and for all eternity. But because God loves us, Christ went to the cross so we can be completely forgiven, know him now intimately, and have the guarantee of heaven to come because it's a gift of God's grace. When we really get that, there should be a deep, settled joy in our lives. Now I understand life happens. Life can be messy. And I'm not saying we go walking around every day and deny the struggles and the circumstances that are going on. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is in the midst of those struggles, there can still be a deep underlying joy that God loves me exactly as I am, that God is with me in this struggle. I'm not alone. That he can bring good out of the struggle. And ultimately, those struggles are not going to last. We're all going to pass away someday. And I will be in the intimate, loving presence of God forever and ever and ever with no more mourning or crying and pain. Not in place of the struggles, but in the midst of them, there can be a deep, deep joy that we still have. But how do we try to maintain that joy? David prays to God in Psalm 51.10, Restore to me the joy of my salvation. How is joy restored? First thing we must do is spend time with God. We grow in our human relationships by spending time with people, by getting to know them. And it's the same in our relationship with God. David also reminds us in Psalm 1611, he's praise to God. You have made known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Joy comes from being in the presence of the God who is joy. It comes from fellowshipping with him as we spend time reading his word, the scriptures he has given us, spend time praying, spend time in worship where God inhabits our praises. The fruit of the spirit, one of which is joy, will grow within us steadily the more we grow in our relationship with God. But a second thing we can consistently do to 
grow in our joy and maintain that joy. For Christians, is focus on who we are in Christ. This is choosing to see ourselves as God sees us. This was the source of Isaiah's joy. He says in chapter 61.10, the italics again are mine. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. Why? For or because he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe of righteousness. Isaiah rejoiced or had great joy as he focused on his salvation. Specifically, as he saw how God sees him clothed in God's own righteousness. When we as Christians consistently focus on the fact that we are God's children, that we are his possession, that we are completely and totally forgiven, when we meditate on the truth that God the Father loves me just as much as he loves Jesus, John 17, 23. When we know God has taken all the guilt, judgment, and condemnation we deserve out of our account and has placed into that account the very righteousness of Christ. That when God looks at us, he sees us through the cross clothed in his own righteousness. He sees us as holy and righteous in him. When we trust that having been given God's own righteousness completely secures our forgiveness and our eternity to come, heaven is guaranteed. There's nothing we can do to earn it by being good enough. It's a gift of God's grace. When we realize God is so thrilled to be in relationship with us that he rejoices over us with singing. And when we focus on the fact that God, the Holy Spirit, dwells within us, we're not alone in our struggles. He's here as close as close can be. The God who sings over us also hurts with us and for us. And he desires to be, Psalm 46, 1, our refuge and strength, our ever-present help in trouble. When we are consistently filling our minds on these truths, there can be a deep underlying current of joy. even in the midst of the struggles we're going through. As we close in Romans 4, 6 to 8, Paul quotes David's words from Psalm 32 about being made righteous in right relationship with God and the resulting joy of that. King David spoke of this describing the happiness of an undeserving sinner who is declared to be righteous. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sins are put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose sin is no longer counted against them by the Lord. Join me in prayer. Lord God, we worship you and praise you for who you are in your being. You are holy and just, all-powerful and all-knowing. You are love. And you are joy. Stir our hearts, God, to grow in relationship with you. 
that as we spend time with you, fellowshipping with you through prayer and reading your word and, and worship, that you will increase our joy. And as we do those spiritual disciplines, we would not only understand more of who you are, but grow in relationship with you and realize who we are in relationship with you. Your treasured possession, clothed in your righteousness, now and for all eternity. We pray these things so that the very joy of Christ would be in us and that our joy would overflow from us. In Jesus' name, amen.